Well, good morning, and I greatly appreciate the opportunity to share a few thoughts from the ground floor, so they, as they say. Uh, we in states and at the local level find ourselves uh, translating much of the work you all do on internet policy into actionable initiatives that we can govern uh, to see them impact the lives of our uh, citizenry. Uh, I want to begin, like the others, in expressing my uh, well wishes to the congressman and for his uh, mother. Uh, I am honored in Virginia to have a very, very strong technology savvy uh, congressional delegation, both with uh, Congressman Goodlatte and Congressman Voucher, but even beyond. Uh, incoming Senator Mark Warner and I traveled the state for the last year as part of our broadband roundtable, and he's going to be an extremely effective uh, member of the U.S. Senate. We're excited to see his uh, leadership. I am, uh, I'm here to share with you a few perspectives on how we in the Commonwealth think about technology policy uh, as a way to transform our overall approach to governing. But I want to begin with a few words about what Virginia is so that you have the context around the remarks I will share. Uh, first and foremost, we are somewhat blessed in Virginia to be reasonably effective in our economic position. While the nation is struggling from an economic standpoint, Virginia is struggling, but is struggling a bit less severely than our sister states. And we'll talk a little bit more about the reasons for that, but I would argue that net policy, technology policy, is a significant factor, and I'll get into that later. Uh, second, we are humbled by a bipartisan spirit of effective management. For Virginians, uh, making sure that we get the best value out of our taxpayer dollar is our top priority. Whether you have a D or an R behind your name is almost irrelevant. Uh, we have a deep and long-standing bipartisan commitment to the initiative. We were humbled once again that Governing Magazine named Virginia amongst the best performing states in the nation with the highest grade in the country in our ability to govern our people and our use of information to make better decisions. I'm also uh, pleased to report that in Virginia, we've taken the long view. Uh, in 2007, we celebrated the 400th anniversary of, of the birth of America, frankly, with the work at Jamestown, the colony and uh, establishment at Jamestown. And it's given us that perspective that the future is a lot of what we, fo we focus our energies on. And it is in that context that we've put a lot of our effort behind education I'll be talking about that topic in a moment, but we were humbled that uh, about two years ago, uh, a child born in the Commonwealth of Virginia was considered to have the highest probability of lifetime success when you measure all the factors in terms of the educational outcomes as well as our commitment to uh, economic growth. So we come from a position where we've had a long history of reasonably sound governance uh, which has set us up to be a little bit more aggressive in the implementation of the Internet policy as we describe it. Frankly, as I look to the work we've been doing over the last several years, we believe under Governor Kane's leadership that in many ways technology policy has been at the heart of our approach to 21st century governance. And what I'd like to do is share with you three pillars of that approach to give you some window into how state and local policy is affected by work that's happening here on Capitol Hill. Those three pillars are our commitment to open government, our ability to transform our health care system, and our desire to ensure we have an innovation-powered economic growth strategy. So allow me to take a moment in each of these areas and then uh, clearly would welcome the opportunity for, for conversation and for dialogue. Let me begin with open government. I have been uh, impressed uh, with the history of Virginia's approach to the issue of government, in large part because we've been doing it on a shoestring budget. On almost every indicator of how much we spend on, on government services, we appear near the bottom. We spend the least in the country on Medicaid, and you know, you go down the list of all the different service areas, we're, we're, we're very, relatively uh, cheap in our, in our ability to spend. But one of the areas where we've been a little bit more aggressive in our spending of late has been the area of technology infrastructure. One of the principles of open government is that you want to make the information more transparent to the citizenry, more engaging to get more individuals from the Commonwealth you know, involved in the decision making as well as the implementation of our government, and frankly to be able to hold our leaders more accountable. In order to do any of those things, our first principle in open government was that we needed to have a robust and modern IT infrastructure. So much of our data has been sitting behind old legacy systems that nobody in their right mind could get it. If I wanted to know, if, actually let me share with you a very candid example from the governor. 
Governor Kane's top priority when he was elected was to tackle the issue of pre-kindergarten education. He traveled to every single school district in the Commonwealth during his tenure as Lieutenant Governor. And one of his most uh, critical pathways in terms of reform was understanding that children who fail the third grade reading test have a, it's a very bifurcating moment for a child. You fail the third grade reading test and you have a high probability of future uh, academic failure. Pass the third grade reading test and you happen to have a very high probability of academic success. Sort of one of those unique moments in a child's life. It's really sad to think about third grade being the bifurcating moment for your life, but in fact the data would suggest it is to such a degree, to a, degree a, a reality. Well, one of the questions that comes up when you think about the question of third grade reading, and about 20 to 25 percent of Virginian children fail that exam. So one of the questions is, what's the root cause of the failure? What correlates to failure? And one of the key hypotheses is that whether or not you invest in early childhood education, that would inform their ability to succeed. In other words, a dollar invested in, in pre-kindergarten should yield a certain reduction in the failure rate in third grade. Now, there are academic studies that prove this in the literature. But to sort of show on the ground data in Virginia, you have to correlate databases that don't talk to one another. The enrollment databases for all the pre-kindergarten programs that are publicly subsidized are over here. The databases on how we govern our third grade reading scores are over here. And there are very thoughtful and appropriate privacy policies that restrict our ability to share. But it makes making better data-driven decisions very, very difficult. So open government, first and foremost, begins with an open and more modern IT infrastructure that would allow the policymakers to make the right judgments when and how and in what manner can you in a safe and secure and private way uh, allow for decision making for information that cuts across. I'd love to be able to correlate the academic performance against the, the, the parents' uh, employment status or their presence or, or their income stream in terms of uh, 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 social service benefits and start to correlate various pieces of our uh, 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 government bureaucracy in how they relate to the performance of that child in that third grade exam. We have all this data, we just can't mine it because the information is siloed. So early on in the Commonwealth uh, in 2005 under Governor Warner's leadership, we embarked on a fairly ambitious plan. We knew that no lawmaker would authorize $300 million to fund a modernized IT infrastructure. That was roughly the price tag we had estimated. And in a world where you have to choose between funding more healthcare services or social services or uh, cops on the ground, uh, frankly, getting $300 million in a one-time shot for IT probably wasn't going to cut it. We entered into an innovative public-private partnership with a firm called Northrop Grumman, who basically said, we will front the upfront investment. In fact, it came out to be roughly $270 million. We'll pay for a brand new uh, network of data centers, an upgraded network system, uh, a more secure environment and all the rest, m new PCs for every employee and so forth. We'll make that upfront investment. Just level pay us your annual operating spend for IT infrastructure, which is about $236 million a year. Provide for us that revenue stream for 10 years and we will deliver efficiencies and pay back the initial investment we made and then some. Um, it was a pretty aggressive uh, initiative, and I will say to you, uh, not without its challenges. Unfortunately, one of the biggest challenges is my good friends in Washington. Uh, we at the federal level set standards for how we allocate uh, cost reimbursement formulas for government purchases of IT. Probably the single biggest implementation challenge for us, which we didn't expect to be as problematic as it was, was federal cost allocation principles that basically made it extremely difficult for us to share the IT resources in a manner that was effective for everybody. Just to give you an example of how this works from an internet policy standpoint, the average federally funded state administered program would lead to about a 75% underutilization of server capacity. What would happen? We'd get a grant from a federal agency that would say, look, here are some very complicated and arcane accounting rules. In order for you to comply with these rules, it's probably easier for you to buy a brand new server and just bill us back for that server that's dedicated to the purpose of what the federal grant was. It's a lot easier to execute that strategy than to say, gosh, I've got 30% excess capacity on a state-funded server. Maybe I could just allocate that portion to the federal project. That would require reams of paperwork and accounting uh, risk that, frankly, was too difficult to administer. So what did that mean in Virginia when we walked into this environment? 
25% of all of our server capacity was actually utilized. When you added it all up, we had 75% excess capacity in server utilization. No offense, friends, but that's because federal policy makes it very, very difficult to, uh, uh, to, make, that, uh, to make that change. So the foundation of open government was to make sure that we would have in place a modern, more robust, more enterprise approach to IT infrastructure. If Microsoft, Google, and all those folks can put all their applications on the cloud and can run them in these mega, mega data centers, you think government would have the ability to do the same thing and could figure out the accounting rules, but the accounting folks haven't quite gotten together with the tech folks, and when they do, please do that as soon as possible. We might find a more robust opportunity in all the states to see these things happen. The second initiative with respect to open government that, the, that we built upon now that we've been embarking on this transformation initiative was to start to understand the power of data that is today locked and hidden from public view. And I'll give you but one example in this regard to give you some context. Virginia, uh, like every other state, has a fairly robust web presence, www.virginia.gov. What we found, though, was that it was very, very difficult to access searchable data. Even if it was publicly available, the search engines had a hard time breaking through our firewalls and crawling. So I'll tell you from a firsthand experience, I was all new to government when I joined in January of 2006. One of the first things that I found myself doing was going onto our portal and searching inside our, our state portal for documents that could help me make better decisions and learn more of the history of what other agencies were doing in the Commonwealth. And it was very difficult. I would search and nothing would really come up. And I'd be frustrated. Gosh, is all this information that's supposed to be publicly available this hard to find? I couldn't quite get it. We were approached by Google in uh, December of 2006 with the idea that a consortium of the search engines had come together with a protocol, the sitemap protocol. And I'm assuming most of you followed this, so this is not news to anybody. But it required a little bit of homework. What we wanted what we wanted in the collaborative was to say this. If Virginian webmasters, the agency webmasters, that we have 90 plus of them in the Commonwealth, voluntarily implemented the sitemap, it would make it easier for each of the respective search engines to crawl and mine for that data. No cost, but a little bit of labor time. And uh, well, we had a horse trade, so we said, Google, we'd like for some enterprise search capabilities that weren't uh, available, and we have no money, we can't pay you for anything. So, we, along with three other states, formed a collaborative, the Google Sitemap Collaborative, and that launched in, uh, in May of 2007, about four or five months after we vi visited in December. And at the time we, we launched, by the time we launched, well over 60,000 state URLs were sitemapped, and about 60 of our 90 agencies had initiatives underway. We were really robust by about the fall of 2007. Now, just to give you some perspective about how this no-cost, simple, lightweight uh, implementation did for our citizenry, we were averaging 10, 15, maybe 20% growth rates in user sessions on our websites. With no increase in marketing, no new initiatives in IT for web purposes, no dollars spent on IT infrastructure with respect to that web piece, we saw a 40 to 45% increase in each of our respective agencies that adopted the sitemap protocol. Frankly, it became a lot easier to find stuff. I'll just give you a personal example. When I was uh, probably a day or two, uh, before I give a lot of uh, presentations around the Commonwealth, I was invited by NASA to visit the Jamestown uh, colony where we were about to announce that NASA was going to send, in the, uh, send into space a, a sort of an artifact that was found at Jamestown, which we would call essentially a postage stamp. <laughs> it was a little piece of metal with some, uh, uh, some words on it, the uh, word Jamestown written out. And NASA was including this on a, a, sh on a, on a shuttle mission. And the, the ceremony was to deposit this when it returned from the shuttle mission into the museum we built at uh, Jamestown. So uh, the night before my remarks, I did like most of us do to prepare for my remarks, I decided to go online to look for information. And so I went to the state portal, the uh, www.virginia.gov, and I typed in jamestown.ppt to find out what uh, PowerPoint slides might have been used to sort of tell the story of Jamestown. And wouldn't you know it, up popped hundreds of children presentations from our K-12 system. 
because our schools adopted the sitemap protocol. And I spent hours reading kids in the third, fourth, fifth, eighth, tenth grades doing PowerPoint slides on what Jamestown meant to them. It was a heck of a lot more research than I needed for my little remarks. But it gave you an indication of how easy it is to get access to information when, when you have uh, the sitemap protocol. By the way, the, the downside of this is that it really raised the ires of a number of privacy folks because it became a lot easier to find publicly available data. Anybody that served on a board or a commission has to fill out their home address and so forth. And now all that stuff is out there. So it opened up a number of questions that these documents are public documents, but it includes personally identifiable information. It's allowed for us a new dialogue around what we consider to be appropriate to post on the web and what is not, and open up that debate. What should we constitute as personally identifiable information? And you'll see these kinds of circumstances uh, arise. The last principle of open government before I move on to healthcare is that it also allowed for us to think a little bit about engaging the public in new ways to inform and improve government uh, uh, activities. And let me give you but one example. Again, the power of a, ha of a robust IT platform allows us to do this. The story here is about STEM education. In 2007, uh, Governor Kane had accepted an offer by NASA, and I just say NASA because we happen to have a, a large NASA Langley facility in the Commonwealth. Very proud of our relationship with NASA. Uh, NASA has a program where they allow uh, some kind of a sabbatical for senior management, and they had offered us a senior executive within NASA who volunteered to join the governor's initiatives around STEM education. And specifically, what we said was that the physics standards these are the standards that govern how we uh, teach kids physics in the Commonwealth. They were up for review in 2010. We wanted to have a, a sort of an external group of advisors, scientists that are teachers in and out of their educational system, to read the standards, review them, and then make recommendations. And those recommendations would inform the process. So it's sort of typical government approach. You get recommendations in 2007. They are handed off in 2008. A new committee will be formed in 2009. The new standard will be issued in 2010. And hopefully by 2011, we're going to be an issue, issuing new textbooks with new standards so kids will learn good stuff. Now, for those of us here who are fascinated with internet speed, I'm not so sure that's speed. So the question was this. First and foremost, we, we came up with two observations. Number one, actually three. Number one, we learned that the current standards were primarily focused on core principles of physics. And there was very little in our standards that talked about emerging technologies. Nothing on uh, spintronics, barely anything on nanotechnology, nothing on modeling and simulation. You can go down the list of what we know today to be modern physics and its application in our world, and none of it existed in our curriculum. Teachers, by the way, would voluntarily grab stuff on their own and they would try to present these ideas, but the standard itself lacked them. Number two, uh, some of the information was outdated. I was particularly frustrated that textbooks today in Virginia tell children that the main component of a television is the cathode ray tube. What's particularly depressing about that is we've lost about 100 jobs manufacturing cathode ray tubes in the south side of Virginia. And I kept wondering to myself, how would families at the dinner table talk about the fact that they no longer manufacture the device that is supposed to be at the heart of what we watch every day in our living rooms? Pretty disheartening. The third aspect of what we found was that uh, we'd never really asked the question, what should every child know about physics? So the, the science stars who are going to move on to you know, go to the moon or whatever we're going to do in our, our future uh, science policy, those individuals frankly, uh, are taken care of. They've got the AP and the, you know, the series of uh, expert initiatives. But what should 90% of the citizenry know about physics? Do we have kind of physics for everyone in any of our curricula? And again, we were not clear as to what the answer to that would be. So we had specific recommendations. So the committee was jazzed up to put together all these slides and PowerPoint and Word documents, and they were excited. And then we were sort of scratching our heads. Now what? Our Department of Education said, thank you. This is going to be helpful to us as our process begins. It actually kicks off on Thursday, and we're going to have a process. But we said, let's do something a little bit interesting. You know, we've got this robust infrastructure on the IT front. Why don't we give this a little spin? We were approached by a nonprofit called CK12, 
uh, Silicon Valley uh, based uh, nonprofit founded by uh, Niru Kosla, wife of Vinod Kosla, famed uh, Silicon Valley entrepreneur. And basically, they wanted to do to the textbook industry what iTunes has done to the music industry. We want to be able to rip, mix, and burn educational content. And uh, we said, geez, what an opportunity for collaboration. Because we've identified all these subjects that today don't have content organized and reviewed to meet any kind of quality control available for the citizenry. So what we said was this. In September of 2008, we said, let's do something pretty interesting. Let's issue a call for participation. We have no budget. You're not going to get paid a nickel. But anybody out there in the world who would like to help us write physics chapters in those areas where we don't have content today that's been approved by standards and so forth, maybe you could help us publish the very first open source physics compilation of educational materials. Dubbed the Virginia Physics Flexbook, we announced in October that there were about a dozen people all over the country, uh, researchers from Utah, North Carolina, Virginia, Maryland, a 10th grade student, a college freshman, all across the country saying, sign me up. Now these are Americans. Did they go through some kind of employment screening? Have they gone through some kind of bureaucratic uh, process? We reviewed their applications, peer reviewed the quality of the material they're going to talk about, designated a professor at William & Mary who's agreed to make sure this goes through peer quality review, set up three other levels of reviews to make sure the content is strong. And by February 23rd of this year, Virginia will have its very first physics flexbook available with 10 brand new chapters that any teacher, not just in Virginia, but anywhere in the world, can rip, mix, and burn to incorporate into their educational coursework. Now just think about speed. This will be done before we'll even have started the new standards work in physics. And it's important to note we are not calling this a textbook. This is going to be a package of supplemental materials because the unit of currency in this world is, is chapters, not book. Much like in my favorite iTunes, I, this is my life. You know, I'm, I'm an Apple g just worshiper, basically. My iPhone is my life. I, I, I thank the God of Steve Jobs every time I use this device. But, but now, instead of listening to an album, I listen to songs, and I can download a chapter like I used to download a book. This is how we are organizing, at least in this little experiment that we're doing. And it's powered by wiki and other technology that would allow you to bring a group of collaborators to, to bring their content into a community. And now the state of Ohio is called and said, we'd love to be a partner in this. Imagine someone in Virginia writes the modeling and simulation chapter. Someone in Ohio grabs it and then adds 10% more value. Someone in California adds 15% more value. All of a sudden, we got 15 flavors of modeling and simulation to choose from. What an excitement. This is Baskin Robbins 31 flavors for, tech, for education, uh, supplemental educational materials. So the power of open government, when you have a robust infrastructure, is that you can make information more accessible, you can collaborate with people to develop new content, and you can do more to ensure that the people of the, of the Commonwealth can hold their elected officials accountable. I won't spend any time on it, but we also developed an accountability system called Virginia Performs where what the governor has said is it's nice that we do things in government, which is sort of paper processing. Whenever we ask the agencies, what do you do? Well, I've processed this form. That's fine. What the governor has now done is every single agency in government has to list up to three outcome measures. I lower the childhood obesity rate by. I ensure third graders pass the reading test by. And that those indicators are now public. You can see that on our portal, Virginia Performs. And you can see it down to the zip code level in your own community. So while the statewide average might be pretty strong on third grade reading, you could find out if your community is better or worse. Let me share just a few minutes on health care, the economy, and then I'll wrap. On health care, we understand that there are going to be large debates about what the right policy positions should be. But there seems to be some consistency in, in, in the views on either side of the aisle that at least the role of technology should play a bigger uh, one in our healthcare system. Now, 
uh, I was very kind of just been told, that, you know, that the baby announcement was just made uh, prior to my uh, kept coming here. My wife and I uh, had our baby a couple, about last week actually, in, in Richmond, Virginia. I had to fill out my insurance information no less than three separate times because the, the, you know, one medical practice needed it this way, then it was, this person came in for a consult, had to go through that paperwork, hospital had its own. I went online to register for the hospital, but then the paperwork still required to be filled out when I got there. I mean, silliness. But more pr pressing for my wife, uh, data that was captured in the hospital was not available to the doctor. So when my wife said, did you get the, my lab work done? They were, oh, we, we, we didn't get it back from the hospital yet because the systems weren't, weren't linked to be able to make that happen. I will make this broad analogy and then share with you how we're, what, what, our, what our strategy is in, in Virginia, but the broad strategy. If you walk into any retailer in this country today, they can tell you with fairly high precision that if the weather is a certain temperature and you had a history of buying a certain amount of product, which they track when you scan all your stuff in the, in the checkout, that they know with some probability what you might be interested in buying on this trip. In other words, they have terabytes of data they use to inform how they market you in a very targeted way to increase sales. In the healthcare industry, no one has any information about anything. So there is no terabyte of data that one could mine to say, geez, why did 70% of the people go through the emergency room for primary care when they could have gotten into a same-day clinic in an outpatient arena somewhere else? We yell at the hospital for not doing more, and we try to tell the insurance companies to pay for more of this, that, or the other. But at the heart of the matter, we lack the basic data. So what we did was Governor Kane uh, was very, very pleased to partner with Secretary Levitt uh, in Virginia, we issued an executive order that replicated a federal executive order calling for a value-based health care initiative. But what the governor did was he said to me, our Secretary of Health and our Secretary of Administration, I want you to use our state employee health plan as an, a test bed for innovation. I don't want just the average Joe approach to insurance reform. You know, the old days of how you do it in health care insurance from an employee benefit standpoint is you'd say, how cheap can you process my claim? How cost effective is your network of providers? And how good is your you know, uh, responsiveness to our questions, concerns, and so forth? Very basic commodity service procurements is basically how we all govern our insurance contracts. Well, we have this public-private partnership law that allows us to be a little bit more creative in how we approach this. So we stripped out something. What we said was this. We want to create that terabyte of data with respect to privacy and all the certain things, so it'll be outside of the government domain. There's all these specifics in there. But what we want more than anything else is on a voluntary basis, if the employee wants it, we want to create a platform, much like the retailers have, that says, how does one access our healthcare system? And let's mine the actions to figure out how and in what manner we can intervene in a thoughtful way with patient permission. Simple example. Oh, by the way, we'll be announcing the awardee of that uh, solicitation in the coming weeks, but I'm, I'm hopeful, according to Aon Consulting, that this initiative we've embarked upon for the last year and a half, according to Aon, was quoted as saying, this will be the most uh, innovative approach to comprehensive care management in the public or private sector. And I'm very humbled that Governor Kane challenged us to push, so I'm excited to share the results when it's public. But I will say this, just a personal example. We learned that for women who are pregnant, an early enrollment in... Uh, Prenatal care is important to lower the risk of preterm delivery and uh, the risks of infant mortality and so forth. And there are disease management programs. They, they don't have to be called disease management in this case. One of them is uh, uh, Future Moms, which is a program we have in Virginia that says, look, if you, if you join this program, we'll waive your co-pays to the hospital, but we'll get you all the prenatal support you need. The problem is we didn't know about the program. And... Uh, in the current world, we, we, my wife and I got a postcard in the mail probably halfway through her second trimester. And it said to enroll, you must enroll in your first trimester. So we sort of missed. But the question that it raised for me was this. Someone on the data mining side could have known that my wife visited an OBGYN and could have known that she had ordered certain tests that were highly correlated with whether or not she's pregnant. And that information, if we allowed for that to be used to inform us to make better decision making, could have told my wife, FYI, we think, you might have been, uh, uh, we think you might be pregnant. If so, you might want to look into this program. Targeted, data-driven intervention 
uh, is something that we lack today in our, in our healthcare industry. So we're, we're looking to make some transformational change. Uh, we also, quick, quick note for those of you that are interested in data standards, we also see states playing a more active role in developing a governance framework for data standards. Uh, what we're seeing at the federal level is the creation of IT standards in healthcare, what I would refer to as the supply governance. There are 70, 80, 90 data standards that are now uh, published uh, through the Health Information Technology and Standards Panel under President Bush's leadership. And it's up to the states to say, we, we've passed a law that requires all state purchases of health IT systems to be compliant with national standards. We're setting up a, we're proposing legislation this week, our session starts tonight. We are proposing legislation this week that will formalize a demand uh, standards uh, panel, a group of IT experts that we will call upon to help decide which of the 75 standards we would like to mandate as part of our procurement activities. And more importantly, what should we do as feedback loop to the federal government to say, please develop these new standards because they don't yet exist. So we see a very synergistic relationship between the state and the federal level. Last comment, and I will wrap on this, is the issue of the economy. Governor Kane has probably spent more time on economic development than almost any other subject. Well, that besides cutting the budget, which he's had to do four or five times over the past three years. But economic development is sort of at the heart of what every governor has to do. When they wake up in the morning and they go to bed at night, they track how many new jobs were created. And in this particular period in American history, it's all the more important. But one of the things we've learned in this 21st century economy is that now, more than ever, we believe that the role of universities and research and development will be even more critical to how we do economic development than in years past. Now, for those of us in technology policy, it's probably a new world to think about how economic development happens. Economic development happens in a very crude and traditional way in most parts of the country. What happens is an employer will say, I want to place a manufacturing plant somewhere, and uh, I want all you states and local governments to put together, quote, packages to incentivize me to bring my jobs to your community. You know, uh, provide for me some roads, some broadband infrastructure, and so forth and so on. And that is a key part of how we, we negotiate uh, and compete with other states. It's sort of an interesting model. I'll leave it to the academics to decide if that's good, bad, or what. But it is how we uh, operate today. And all the states have these incentive funds, and we all work together, and it's fine. The biggest economic development transaction in Virginia was the announcement that Rolls-Royce would place a $500 million jet engine manufacturing plant in one of our rural communities. Now, this is a very important deal for the Commonwealth. It was an indication of the Forbes.com ranking that Virginia is the best state in America to do business. But, and for all my tech entrepreneurs in the room, please come to Virginia. We find ourselves to be very hospitable to you. Uh, but I will say this. What cinched the deal was a $40 million investment the Commonwealth of Virginia made, not necessarily in subsidizing the manufacturing plant, but by building a research and development center of excellence that merged our brain power at UVA and Virginia Tech. Hokies and Wahoos coming together. This is sort of a unique thing in Virginia. And they came together in a very creative manner that said, look, we think that our professors, students, and so forth can help you develop jet engines of the future. And now what does this mean from an academic standpoint? That means historically incentives have all been about the cost side of the ledger. We will lower your operating costs. We will subsidize your operating costs. For the first time, at least from our vantage point, a mega project, this sort of massive $500 million project, was driven by revenue support which is we're going to help you build and design the engines of the future. And we've done it in an open and collaborative way, and there are a lot of intellectual property rules and so forth. It's a fascinating deal for those of you that care about R&D policy. Please take a look at what we've done in Virginia. It's, an, it's a model that I think has sort of breaking the mold, broken the mold in terms of how we, we manage the whole uh, buy dole and all the various apparatuses around, that, around the issue of R&D. But it opened up our eyes that we need to think more creatively about how we, we govern our R&D assets. Uh, the governor will announce today that more legislation is coming to structure a brand new information, uh, sorry, an, uh, a, a, um, an entrepreneurship and innovation uh, investment authority. Uh, we had no good cool acronym on this one, I'm sorry. It's, but, but the point is we're going to have a new governance model that will set a long-term strategic roadmap to ensure the Commonwealth's R&D assets are aligned with our long-term prospects for economic growth. And so when the state makes incremental investments in R&D, 
we are contributing towards a larger uh, opportunity with respect to our, our, uh, our potential. We also are announcing this week that uh, legislation is forthcoming. Uh, we, will, we will be targeting our angel investor tax credit. Half of the angel investor tax credit will now focus on commercializing university inventions. I don't know any other states that are working on that particular piece of legislation, but I wanted to share with you how we're pursuing it. And then last but not least, we recognize the power of broadband. You've, pr you've had more presentations on broadband than anywhere else, but I will make this simple adage for my friends at the federal level. If you think about broadband infrastructure as sort of the base minimum step necessary in order to drive our, our 21st century approach to economic development, I would say this. When you think about setting broadband policy at the federal level, ask yourself what it's like to be in Franklin County, Virginia. Franklin County, Virginia is affectionately known as the moonshine capital of the Commonwealth, probably of the country. Uh, but it's a wonderful place, a wonderful place. And what you find in Franklin County is the following. We need, we've got E-rate money coming to the schools. We get Homeland Security grants for first responders. We've got some state uh, networks that have to be built to support state agencies. We've got some public health assets that, account, that, that achieve, receive money on the telemedicine piece. We've got all these siloed sources of funding that come from all these different federal revenue streams. It is excruciatingly difficult to try to pe uh, piece together an enterprise strategy that would leverage all of these things in a, in a way through public-private partnerships that can both wire up publicly important assets but also allow for last mile connectivity to the private sector. Now we're making great progress in this area, but my one humble request to you geniuses is to figure out a way to make it easier for locality. Sit in a locality and ask yourself, how hard is it today to stitch together all these revenue streams and put together a true collaborative approach to broadband that, in, that respects the principles of the private sector but drives the adoption we so desire in the public sector? That's my one request of you. It's not the easiest. But I'll end with this. I'll end with this. And it has very little to do with technology policy. And it ends with this notion that there's a, a broader discussion that we need to have. And uh, the dear friend from the European Parliament actually said it best. He, his words, I think, were ICT for everyone. I want to end with this comment. In my responsibility to serve the governor, one of the things that I take as my personal responsibility <coughs> is that every single Virginian should have the chance to play effectively in the 21st century technology economy. And more specifically, what I mean by that is that those who may not have credentials, the under-credentialed, the high school dropout, those individuals deserve a chance to play in our economy. We tried to figure out, if you were a high school dropout living in one of our rural communities, how hard is it for you to apply for a job in the tech industry? And of course you know you can't get a job in the tech industry. It's just not even, it's a laughable proposition. But we thought we could do something about this challenge. In February, we will launch the very first class of a new initiative we're calling Plugged In. Plugged In is for GED. And it rests on the very basic hypothesis that in six months, we can take a high school dropout and prepare them for a technology job and to be successful and to thrive in that environment. What we said was this. Let's reconstitute the curriculum for the GED for adults. Let's add in, in this case, I want to thank Microsoft for being a partner to bring their IT academy into the mix. Let's add in certificates that are available to the uh, in the, you know, in the private sector. Let's add in a contextualization program that meant that the children that are enrolled have to produce something, whether it be a video game or another program or something to that effect. But what would happen if you harmonized all of these three principles and put together a brand new curriculum from scratch? We funded this sort of R&D project. Could such a curriculum exist? Our first batch of 30 students will be enrolled in February. I'm pleased to report they'll be in Congress and Boucher's district. But more to the point, and this is exciting, Northrop Grumman, that multi-billion dollar IT company that, that has a large IT uh, division, has agreed to give every one of those students who graduate an entry level job interview with high probability that they will accept jobs that are available for them today. Bring it all together. Develop that new curriculum, connect them to employers, and find a way to convert the uncredentialed 
onto a career path for our future. This basic premise that we have in Virginia is that we must uncover all of the hidden talent that we know that exists. For us to truly succeed in this global economy, we're gonna to have to find ways, not just to take our top 10% and squeeze out more value, but to tap into the power and the raw material we have in our broader 90%. And when plugged into this more modern environment, this more massive infrastructure, get them to start becoming entrepreneurs, developing Facebook applications in their basement, working on new ways to think about how we govern our healthcare system and so forth. We know over the next decade, a great deal of Virginia's economic growth will come from some place we would not expect. My hope is it's gonna come from those, uh, those individuals whose talents we uncover. Thank you for hearing me out and I appreciate the time this morning. I was going a little longer than expected because of the change in the schedule, so forgive me if I, I, I would drag on, but I'm happy to take any questions that you may have. Good morning. Uh, my question is, uh, Virginia Performs is an excellent website. Oh, thank you. And brought a great deal of information as a resident of Virginia. Thank you. But I also wanted to know um, what key initiatives may be on the horizon that will further avail data-driven decisions for the executives in the Commonwealth? Uh, we did uh, an, a statewide procurement for a business intelligence software platform. And we awarded that contract. Uh, it was very interesting for my friends from the big players, the IBMs, the other words. Uh, we ended up picking a startup, Logi XML, based in Virginia. Now, why is that relevant? We believe there needs to be an enterprise approach to data, data uh, analytics and reporting that while we have over 2,000 legacy applications to run the guts of government, that if we could liberate them from the legacy applications themselves, the data, put them into a more robust business intelligence platform, we'll be in a better position to see real-time information in a way that we could correlate, cross-tab, and so forth. We believe the Logi platform will give us that, that, that strength. But I will say this, I am days away, I've been begging a very large technology company, basically begging on hands and knees, to give me something that uh, is not a commercially available product. But basically what I want is I want a robust uh, a, a platform that would allow me to preserve my mainframe systems that have been around for 30 years. See, for those of us in IT, the, of course the storyline is, oh, we gotta get rid of the old COBOL stuff, it's broken, it's old. But you know, that's like a billion dollar price tag to gut, replace all the gut systems. But the backup is that if you can build this sort of uh, connector that has the ability to preserve and isolate the needs of, of that particular COBOL system, then I can pull data and use it in a way that we hadn't seen before and not worry as much about whether or not the system's built on COBOL. This is not a commercial, there's, of course the vendors are gonna now yell me, oh I have this, I have, no they don't. I have a specific goal in mind. What, what, what I will do as a matter of process is if this firm is willing to do this, the day I get it, I'm posting it on my website, and I'm gonna beg every other company in the country or the world to look at it and tell me how they can offer that concept better and we'll do a procurement. But that's what I need. Hi, I really uh, enjoyed your um, explanation of the Flexbook program Thank you. Um, in Virginia. And just wondering for other statewide networks that particularly serve the uh, K-12 or uh, education markets, how do we partner to um, you know, kind of get that information and be able to share that and uh, make that available to other states? Well, first and foremost, the great news there is uh, the technology is free. CK12.org is free. They're not alone. I think there's connections out of Rice University in Texas. Uh, there's Curriki, which is a, 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 a nonprofit out of Sun, uh, I think with an office here in Washington. There are tools that are free. You can use them today. The hard part for those of us in new media is that these tools are running faster than our government apparatus is ready to accept them. So what we had was, a, a, what, the key to that program was that the, 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 direct, the superintendent of education, Dr. Pat Wright, God bless her soul, because she was willing to do an R&D project and a shake it up a little bit inside the organization. Now, you need a leader like a Pat Wright in your Department of Education who's willing to take a chance so governing the R&D project as it is, she was willing to allow for this model. And we will learn from it, and I think from the learning, 
there will be a, a sort of a sharing of best practices elsewhere in the country. There are clearly people who called and said, can we connect and play a, and I would welcome in emails and all the rest will do. But I think the key is linking it up to our operating units and having them bless it. Um, uh, fascinating talk. Thank you very much for that. Um, is there a URL for the Plugged In initiative? Plugged In does not have a URL, uh, but we do have commercials that we've shot in the community to encourage kids to, to do, right. and those are posted online uh, under our Department of Adult Education. Um, when we complete the curriculum and develop, get the first class going, I'm fairly confident we're going to have an aggressive web presence to push the story out. Uh, and what I would ask is that we, we find a way to connect. And I'll, I'll, yeah. But on my website, technology.virginia.gov, I typically host at least the links to the major initiatives that we're, we're governing. Thank you. Thanks. Yes, sir. I don't know if it's appropriate for the other speaker to come up, but what I've been fascinated with your discussion, collaboration's been the key to about everything you've done. Yes. And you have the European Union of yes. all these different countries. You know, how do you get the countries, um, the, the industries together? It would be really fascinating to talk about the principles of collaboration to build success, both here in this country as well as what we're seeing in the European Union. You know, it's, uh, we have these old sister city, sister country type relationships that we've just not dusted off a lot recently to make better. And uh, on one-off uh, areas, we're doing more and more of that. For example, in the celebration of Jamestown, a number of leaders from the UK were obviously heavily engaged in planning efforts as the Queen's visit and, you know, God bless her soul and all the rest. So a delegation from Scotland uh, came to Virginia and said, we want to develop a performance management system akin to the Virginia Performs, as a young lady referenced on the front line. And so we are learning from how they're approaching their performance management. What are the metrics? The, the secret to this stuff has nothing to do with technology. It asks the following question. What are the 10 metrics that Governor Kane should look at every morning? Right? What is it that should drive our knowledge of whether we're doing a good job or a bad job? And we want leading indicators, not stuff that's built on eight-month-old data. So that's hard. And if collaborators can say, here's what we think the 10 metrics should be, and here's what we think the 10 metrics should be, we've published our 50 on our Virginia Perform site, but others are going to have better ones. And that's where the collaboration, it's the sharing of the intellectual property that is at the heart of the need for collaboration. Not necessarily are we going to use the same software and so forth. That's what, what my dream is that someone in this room is going to develop a nonprofit best practices think tank that will collect these metrics and say, look, these are the best leading indicators for how you drive effectiveness in government operations. I haven't seen that yet. I will be the first customer to sign up if it exists. Uh, but that's where the collaboration would really be ideal. I'm, I'm respectful of your time, so maybe one more, uh, whatever you think is right. If you could scream maybe louder, we can... Wrap up to your break. My man. Virginia is one of the lead states, along with Massachusetts and California, certain sectors in California, on uh, promoting technology industry. And there are tens of thousands of small startups, in, especially in northern Virginia, and some showing up in southern, that are really producing innovative products based on intellectual property. What is the best way that a state can promote small startups and making sure that, of course, they collaborate with their IP, but it's protected and uh, monetized in a way that they can sell it out to other places? It's a very complicated question. Now, there's two specific things that we are focused on. Number one, our limited entrepreneurship investments. We have an, uh, one of the agencies that I, I have is uh, CIT. It's that upside down looking building by Dulles Airport, if you ever drive by it. Uh, great building, by the way. Uh, that building houses our GAP fund. The GAP fund is where we put limited uh, resources, $100,000 per investment, but we restrict it only to innovative technology companies that are grounded in intellectual property. We have a billion companies in Northern Virginia that are service companies, but it's the grounding of intellectual property that to us is the secret. So it's targeting limited resources to intellectual property. Second, as I said to you earlier, this research and development question, if you add up Maryland, D.C., and Virginia, and you've aggregated the R&D spend, it's $18.5 billion, and my friends in California, you're at $18 billion. 
So the Maryland, D.C., Virginia region has more R&D activity than the state of California. But our ability to commercialize that R&D, in a word, stinks. So what we've tried to do is to bring our research entities into a more intellectual property, fluid type model that is both protective of the IP, but in a way that stimulates the entrepreneurship. That Rolls-Royce transaction is but one example of how it was the IP negotiation that was a critical aspect to make it right. I think that if we get the IP negotiations right out of the universities, we would see a new wave of innovation and entrepreneurship much bigger than if we did any other in the set of levers on the horizon, squeezing the productivity of federally funded, uh, university-driven R&D, I think is the highest leverage point for uh, economic growth. I have taken up way too much of your time. Thank you so much, and I appreciate it.